we're living in a time of sort of bottomless scrutiny and criticism of all of our institutions and educational institutions, um, foremost among them. And that's because, you know, they're, they're subject to so many structural pressures and the weak points um, in their creation are really exposed by the winds of the new society and the world that we're living in. And welcome to EducationFutures.com. I'm Paul Zenke. It's a real pleasure to be joined today by Anya Kamenetz. Anya is a senior writer at Fast Company Magazine and the author of several books, including Generation Debt, and two recent ebooks, Learning, Freedom, and the Web, and The Eddie Punks Guide. Anya is probably best known for her 2010 book, DIYU, Eddie Punks, Eddie Paneers, and the Coming Transformation of Higher Education, which investigates innovations to address the crises in cost, access, and quality in higher education. Anya, thank you for being here. What do you think the purpose is of higher education today, and how do you think that compares with our recent past, and how that relates to the future? I think that as I get deeper into the topic of higher education, it strikes me all the time that, um, you know, there really is a blind man and the elephant quality to it, that people appear to be discussing the same thing, and yet you find that their internal models of what higher education means are very, very different. Um, And so, but I would say, you know, looking at it from the student's point of view, which is not necessarily um, the the mainstream thing to do, but I, I tend to take the learner's point of view, is... Uh, they're looking for um, a way to prove themselves, um, to be distinguished um, in a marketplace, and to join a professional community and a community of, um, <clears throat> of practitioners in general um, in, in, so that they can build a livelihood. Um, and then they're looking for social benefits um, to, um, and this again, you know, kind of pertains to joining a community, but it, you know, has to do with as well finding mentors, ideally. Um, maybe learning a little bit about themselves as well. There's sort of a personal development aspect to particularly higher education, um, or, or all of education, really. Um, and then thirdly, um, and pretty far down on the list, uh, I would say that students pursue higher education in order to acquire specific knowledge and skills. And the reason that I say that that's far down the list is that's because when I ask students um, why they're in college, it's the last thing they think of. Um, but it's also true the case that, you know, we live in a particular moment where, uh, knowledge and skills are increasingly commodified. They're increasingly available to people who are self-directed, um, and you don't need to be in higher education uh, to get those. Do you think educational institutions in general have updated their missions to serve the needs of a new economy, which is like being post-industrial, highly globalized, and really subject to accelerating change? We're living in a time of sort of bottomless scrutiny and criticism of all of our institutions and educational institutions, um, foremost among them. And that's because, you know, they're, they're subject to so many structural pressures and the weak points um, in their creation are really exposed by the winds of the new um, society and the world that we're living in, by techno- technological progress, by globalization. Um, you know, if you think about how um, the, S- the, for example, just let's just take the idea of globalization, right? How that affects the education system. Um, well, in our public schools, what that means is we have people coming into the schools that speak dozens of different languages. Um, and our schools, which were built for an industrial era, you know, there's very few institutions in our society that can sort of accept people that speak dozens of different languages and, and teach them all the same way or offer them all the same service, you know, regardless of whether it's actually education or something else. Um, and then top of that, globalization applies the pressure that um, you know, those students, when they graduate, then need to compete with um, people from all over the world um, and somehow come out on top uh, as Americans. Um, and then we have, um, you know, globalization pressures continue uh, into higher education because we have students competing internationally um, for spots in American universities. Uh, they're taking a lot of the PhDs when they graduate. Um, they are uh, either staying here, starting businesses, or um, more often going back to their home countries. And so, you know, the forces that attack the system are very, very, very complex. And I think that for in many ways, the failures that we uh, put down to educational institutions are really just, um, it's a factor of how important those institutions are and how much we're asking of them um, in this particular time and place. What would you say is the, is the value of a college degree? This is something that's really got to be up to the definition of the individual person of why they're pursuing it. Um, but I think at its best, um, a college degree is a unique kind of currency that uh, has been created by human societies to show that someone has been through a process of uh, personal development, of cultural development, that they are a citizen um, in the true sense of the word, that they're able to um, 
you know, participate in society uh, intelligently, um, ideally that are able to contribute to society and be, you know, be part of that society, build it. Um, and so, uh, you know, and it signals those things to others in, you know, in just those two letters, BA, that we know that someone's been through some kind of process, they have some kind of personal um, resources to be able to do that, whether it's, you know, the money that they come from in their family or just um, their personal determination, you know, they're able to, to stick with it and earn it. So um, a college degree, you know, being a very blunt instrument and sort of a binary measurement, you know, either you have one or you don't, um, it can't do everything perfectly all the time, but I think it has been very, very useful um, in measuring uh, those values at different times. Do you think that high school should be required? The whole idea of compulsory education is a little bit of a strange one in the United States. We've never had um, more than what we have today, which is about a three-fourths um, high school graduation rate. And so even though we compel people to attend, we're not necessarily that great at getting them to graduate. And of those that do graduate in many districts, over half need um, some kind of remedial um, courses to repeat um, when they do get to college, if they get to college. Um, so rather than look at whether or not the law says in the books that you're, you know, you should attend school for this many years, um, I think it might be more interesting and helpful to look at, you know, what are our goals as a society? You know, I think we'd like to have people educated to the best of their abilities, um, and we'd like to offer that opportunity to everyone regardless of their, their background. Um, and so looking at it from the supply side and demand side rather than looking at it as, um, you know, something that we should compel or legislate, uh, I think is far more interesting. So Education Futures is a group of researchers who are very interested in the future of education, certainly. We think that by 2037, technological advancements will make formal education basically obsolete, and the few remaining organized formal schools will close. So that's in 2037. What's your take on that? I'm not sure that I share sort of the bluntness of a projection like that. I think that, you know, it's very easy to envision a world in which formal education is far demoted down the list uh, in terms of uh, choices that individuals have. Um, and then they have many, many other choices besides getting formal education. But I think that we see in a lot of, um, you know, analogies of historical change that, you know, things stay around for a long time and they outlive their usefulness very often. Um, you know, I think uh, I remember reading that the, the Roman Senate, you know, um, met for many, many decades uh, past the time when Rome was actually an empire. So the institution remained as sort of a hollow shell of its former self. And I would not be surprised if 20 years hence, and you're talking about a time when, you know, I had a daughter last year, so she'll be class of, if she graduates college, she'll be class of 2033. Um, I see her going to a college, an accredited college um, of some sort and getting some kind of degree from that. Um, you know, there are many circumstances in which that might not be true, but I don't think that it's going to become, uh, it, even if it becomes totally obsolete in 20 years, I don't think it's going to disappear, if you see what I'm saying. And so another thing that we thought about is that by 2020, 45% of the workforce will identify as being a nomad. I'm interested, how might alternative forms of accreditation serve this entrepreneurial class? Oh, well, we're seeing all kinds of exciting developments in alternative accreditation. I mean, um, you know, there's two major trends, and they sort of uh, work in complementary directions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you know, this more atomized, um, very specific skills-based or oriented um, kind of accreditation, you know, uh, which is best encapsulated, I think, by the badge. Um, so the idea that you're going to earn, uh, you know, individual certifications that um, from tests that are, uh, openly um, created and judged and benchmarked um, by entire communities of practitioners as skills continue to evolve and as people face the need to continuously update their skills, um, the acquisition of these badges is going to be uh, a lifelong uh, sort of sport and pastime and requirement for many, many, you know, for people in almost any profession. Um, and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, I think in a very intriguing way, um, you have sort of the, the person, the whole life, um, well, sort of life as certification, right? So the idea of um, a portfolio-based assessment, um, things that allow you to document your learning that has taken place in various uh, stages and aspects of your life, um, create a narrative around that learning, reflect on that learning, um, and sort of develop those metacognitive skills um, and document the learning that you've done as well. Um, and that that portfolio is not going to, only going to be submitted at a particular moment in time to um, earn credit, at, which I think is a very important um, path toward expanding the number of people who are able to uh, get that signaling effect from education. Um, but not only are you going to submit the portfolio for credit, but in some ways you're going to continuously develop this portfolio as a timeline um, that will stay with you throughout your life um, and, again, help you document 
um, not only your learning, but eventually your professional accomplishments um, and be part of your social graph as well. Well, what core kind of socio-technical practices do you think are shaping the future of learning? The availability of social networks and peer-based um, social networking is really uh, enabling people to make visible um, the peer roles in learning, which uh, had sort of been uh, faded into the background by the last 150 years of formal education, which sort of, um, and really in some sense the last thousand years, which which consisted of, you know, a person up at the room talking and the rest of the people are sitting down. And the assumption is that the person who people are sitting down are very passive listeners and they're not actively involved with each other. And in fact, I mean, we have the, the phrase classmates, but it doesn't um, necessarily give you the idea that you have something valuable to learn from the person sitting next to you or behind you as much as you do from the person in the front of the room. So, with the um, existence of social, of social networks, we now understand that learning is very peer-based, that there's a very huge role for the person who learned a thing that you now need to know five minutes ago. Um, they may have it freshest in their mind and, and easier to impart it back to you. Um, and uh, I think by the same token, you know, a lot of the ways that people communicate um, over social networks, particularly like microblogging, um, is sort of... Uh, it's bringing in entirely new um, sets of challenges into the humanities and what used to be called, you know, various different kinds of authorship and different kinds of texts because the close reading techniques and the ability to verify information, um, which are kind of two of the most important, um, you know, modalities in uh, a text, you know, any kind of text-based learning, so any kind of humanities-based that's not numbers-based learning, um, you know, reading something closely, figuring out what it means, and then, you know, researching, documenting, uh, footnoting, you know, verifying things, um, different kinds of claims. Um, in a world of a constant streams of information, both of those skills become a lot more complex. Um, you know, there's a lot of territory, I would say, to cover in that. How do you think that, again, these things like open accreditation or peer networks or just, just kind of technological platforms in general, how do you think that they can be used to create a more accessible and equitable education system? Um, I'm working on a, a chapter, a book chapter about this right now, and I think it's probably the key question um, as we go into the future of education. I think what what is you know clear being revealed at the moment is that the structures that we're building don't necessarily allow for increased social equity or access um, over and above uh, what we have in the brick and mortar system because um, merely making things available for free doesn't necessarily lower the barriers to access. In fact, we're in danger of recreating many of the different same privileges um, that were, you know, that exist in the ivory tower world um, online because simply because um, people online tend to work through more informal networks and that goes back to the sort of idea of like an old boys network. Um, you know, it's not something that is, it can be more meritocratic in some ways, it can be more open in some ways, but um, in the bottom line, you need to have some kind of more on-ramps um, and ways to make these structures visible to people um, who wouldn't necessarily know how to use them. So, um, you know, there's a really big imperative, and I think that uh, there are worrisome aspects to the claims that people are making that, you know, something like a MOOC, like a Coursera or an Audacity is making something that's open to everyone when, in fact, um, you know, the population that they have is overwhelmingly very smart, very self-directed um, and already privileged in those ways, even if they happen to come from Bangla Bangalore or Bangladesh. Um, so, I, you know, the, the promise that I see, the greatest promises that I see are things that take the remaining existing structures for public use and help to reinvent them with the whole of technology to um, help scaffold people and help people access these online resources and access open resources and give them that little bit of, a, of training wheels that they need maybe to either stay on task or to discover for themselves, you know, what self-motivated learning looks like, um, but offering a little bit of a support system um, to get underway with that. And, and you've done such a wonderful job in your career of documenting the issue of cost in higher education and, and the acute challenges around that. Do you think that how most universities are set up now, that they have the ability to actually in the future have have more flexibility on cost, or do you think alternative models of education, accreditation, things like that, are more reasonable as as responses to you to uh, well? I uh, I guess I have to answer that it's going to be a combination. I mean, you know, I guess basic disruption theory tells us that disruptive um, choices rarely come from inside established institutions. They have too much to lose, and um, it's the new institutions that are really finding um, the ability to you know, offer things at radically lower cost um, and sort of really reframe and question the whole idea of what we mean by higher education. And they're not subject to the same 
scope creep that is really um, stocks our large public institutions in private institutions as well. Um, that said, you know, the, one of the really wonderful things about our universities is that, you know, at, at the high end is that they are incredibly messy and fertile places. And, you know, if you look at, you know, where did the internet come from, for example, right? It comes from it was outside of research. You know, this matrix of, of research, knowledge creation, um, business creation that happens in and around the best universities. Um, and so I would not be surprised, and I am not surprised, to find that something like as, as groundbreaking as, as these massively open online free courses um, coming out of very entrenched existing institutions because they do have room for uh, exploration, um, either at the margins or just kind of um, lying in the middle of things uh, without anyone paying too much attention. As you think about all the things that have happened recently with technology and education, is it your sense that we're entering a period of evolution, or do you think this is more of an educational revolution? Or, or do you think that education might be actually missing out on an opportunity for a revolution? Um, I think that education is a peculiarly resistant to change um, of any institution, because you know the whole purpose of education, formalized education, is to preserve the past. Um, if, if every generation of humans was to start out fresh, um, you know, there'd be no need for his education because people would just work from whatever they found lying around. Um, and it would be like a, a generation of people that all adults had died and people just grew up from childhood with, with no history. Right. Um, and then they wouldn't need to go to school. But, you know, I think, uh, it can be difficult in the time frames that we're talking about to see the difference between evolutionary and revolutionary change. I certainly think that there are um, aspects of what's going on right now that seem um, to completely be redefining and questioning what we mean by education and uh, redefining the place of the institution. And in, in some ways, that's happened surprisingly quickly, even in the um, <clears throat> even in the eight or so years since I first started writing about student loans. Um, you know, there's a real revolution in how we see the value of the higher education. Um, so. You know, um, I guess I would vote on the side of, of very radical change happening, um, but it may not take the forms we expect. Excellent. Well, you've been incredibly generous with your time, and thank you so much for um, for speaking with me. Yeah, you too. You too. Absolutely.